Hello, and welcome to Legal Links. This is a legal information program brought to you by the Oregon State Bar. My name is Agnes Soule. I'm the county attorney for Multnomah County, a former vice president of the Oregon State Bar, and your host for today's program. Today, we'll be discussing hiring a contractor or service provider. Most of us have had the need to hire a painter, a car mechanic, a plumber, or someone to help with household projects or remodeling. Today, we hope to help you make informed decisions when choosing a contractor or service provider, as well as dealing with any problems that may arise during or after the completion of the project. With us today for our discussion are Bill Boyd and Dick Slotty. Bill has been the manager of the Construction Contractor Board's Dispute Resolution Services since 1997. Before that, he practiced construction law for over 10 years. Dick Slotty is a clinical law professor with the Lewis and Clark Legal Clinic in Portland. Welcome to you both, and thank you so much for taking time to join us today. Let's assume we're going to have some construction work done on our house. What kinds of things can we do right up front to make sure that we're going to prevent as many problems as we can? Well, the uh, Construction Contractors Board, which I'm going to refer to as the CCB from now on, has a publication called 16 Ways to Avoid Remodeling, Repair, and Construction Problems. And one of the first things you should do is either go to the CCB's website, uh, and I believe that that'll be shown at some point on this show, uh, or call up the CCB and, uh, and get that, that publication. And I would suggest you read it about three times. And, uh, but in, in brief, one of the things that you most need to do is to hire a reputable contractor. Uh, they, you are putting your home in, in their hands, and uh, if you don't get somebody who is good and really cares about satisfying your needs, you're going to have some problems. You should also make sure that that contractor is a licensed contractor. He needs to be licensed with the CCB. You can determine that by going to the website. Um, you should get several bids. And you should get a, uh, then you should look at those bids and you should not necessarily take the lowest bid. This is not a place where you want to have the low bid contractor, even though NASA goes by that philosophy, you shouldn't. Um, you should use a written contract, and um, one of the things is you should make sure that that contract is in the name of the contractor uh, that is on the CCB website. Uh, sometimes contractors will. Uh, will w have either some other name, they may have their own personal name, you're going to get in all sorts of problems if you don't get the right name on the contract. Um, and Dick, do you, you have some other suggestions on the written contract? A, a couple. I think one of the, the best things is to approach this as a team effort. You're not just turning over the project to the contractor and coming back at the end and saying, oh, well, that's not what I wanted, or this doesn't look right, or whatever. You need to stay involved. You need to ask what they are doing and why they are doing it. You need to have a lot of communication, which unfortunately involves a lot of time on the part of the consumer. And I think, and this is something that Bill's going to comment, and I'm going to comment on throughout the course of this program, one thing to have a written contract. It's another thing to be talking to the contractor or the builder over here and saying, well, let's just do it this way or let's do it that. If that doesn't get put into the contract, just take out a pen and handwrite it somewhere and try and get a date and initial. It doesn't matter if the contract's all nice and printed up. Write something down, get everybody to initial it. It clearly says what you and the builder are changing. If the builder won't do it, uh, that should put you on notice that something's wrong. Yeah, I think it's very important to get those written, what we call change orders, uh, in writing. Um, and you need to be talking to the contractor constantly. Uh, and you need to be looking at what's going on. You can't just walk away and let this happen. We've, we've had people that have had construction projects done at a long distance because they were living down in California. Uh, it's a recipe for disaster. Uh, if you can avoid it, be there, be there on top of it. Uh, the 16 Ways book that I mentioned earlier has some suggestions on how you can avoid the problem of having construction liens put on your home, and uh, you should read that over. It's a little more than I think we can go into today. 
Uh, you should also keep some written records about what's going on, how often the contractor is there, and uh, you know, just basically keep everything. When you start this project, get a folder, put everything in that folder, and make sure that you know where it is. In addition to that, uh, if I was having uh, some major improvements or construction done, what with digital cameras or even just a little disposals, take pictures yes. whenever you're out there. Take pictures and then just file them away somewhere. You never know when a dispute's going to come up and maybe you've got a picture that just identifies exactly what the issue is. Mm -hmm. Now I've had a couple of remodeling uh, jobs done on my house and I know that in getting bids some of the contractors would say I need building permits and others wouldn't. Uh, what do you do about that? You very likely do need building permits and uh, you should make sure that the contractor, either the contractor gets them or in some cases if you know what you're doing you could go down and get them yourself. There are. I don't know which is the most adv advantageous, but you need to make sure that the job is permitted. You'll run into all sorts of problems later on when you try to sell your house if there's a bunch of un unpermitted work done. And in addition, uh, the, you will get an, a city or a county inspector will come out and look at that work to make sure that at least the, the life safety things, like the structural part and the electrical part and the plumbing part, that, that those things are done in a way that your home will be safe. Now that may not ensure and they may not be looking at whether the thing is constructed in the way you want it in terms of aesthetics. Uh, and they won't be looking at the paint and, and other things. But those things you can look at. But the things that you may not be knowledgeable about, uh, they, they, will, they will be looking at. Um, so yes, definitely get building so permits and make sure they're obtained. So if you get a contractor that says, oh, you don't want to get these permits because you don't want the city inspector there, that's probably a clue that you've got the wrong contractor. That's, that's right. <laughs> right. And, and uh, people who try to cut corners by taking the lowest bid and uh, not getting the building permits usually end up with something that's uh, really, really bad. Okay, and how much should I have to put down? How much should I pay up front? That's going to vary. Uh, I've had construction work done in my home and they didn't take anything. They didn't take a deposit. Uh, but I've also, uh, you know, sometimes the contractor that you're getting does not have the financial resources to buy the materials. So you should get some ideas how much the materials are going to cost and that should sort of determine to get them started to your first progress payment. A progress payment is something that you make part way through the job. You should never pay for the whole thing up front. Uh, and so there may be some material costs that that contractor needs to, to get started. Plus the contractor may want to make sure that you're not going to back out of the deal. So uh, you know, anywhere from nothing to maybe a third, all depends on how much that contractor is going to be spending you know, just to get out on the site and start construction. And that's something that you, know, you need to look at. So now one, ad one advantage that the, the builder or the contractor has is as soon as they start working on the house and they start providing labor and supplies and materials, they have the right to put a lien on that house. The house isn't going anywhere. So if, and unlike just a, where you're buying something and promise to pay, if the consumer doesn't pay or, or disappears, the, the seller may be out of, out of luck. But that house is there. And uh, so that may, that's uh, um, a lot of contractors won't charge a lot for a down payment, enough for the materials, as, mm -hmm. as Bill said, but they know that the house is good for the good for the right. payment ultimately. And this is another place where I can sort of insert in that you need to read the contractor. Sometimes the contract is all written, and it's written by the contractor. You need to read that carefully and understand every term. One of the terms you'll often see is a non-refundable deposit. So if for some reason, for instance, you can't get the construction loan or something, you've put down money and you may not have a right to get it back. So you need to read everything. Another good point. We've all seen car purchase contracts this big and you turn them over and it's all this fine print on it and it's so it's so tempting just to say okay gee I don't I'm not gonna understand it the seller doesn't give you much of a chance to read it uh, and a lot of the terms aren't gonna are just boilerplate they're not gonna get changed anyway but with a home construction contract that's a little different because they can be unique from builder to builder and as as impolite as it may seem to you that you're not saying you don't trust the, the builder or the seller. You need to say, 
give me a copy of that contract, go away, come back tomorrow or the next day, and then you need to set aside the time to sit down and read it and highlight those portions you don't understand. And if it's something you don't understand, you need to talk to somebody who can help you understand what it means. It's, I see so many times when people are penny wise and pound foolish. They are signing up to have a home built for like $200,000 and they won't spend, you know, $1,000 or $500 on an attorney that will help them understand what's in that contract. We recently had a, uh, somebody sign up to a contract that said, if you complain about the house, we can buy it back and you, we can force you to sell it back. And in fact, that's what exactly what they've done because this guy complained about the house because the wood was wet when it was installed. He wanted them to fix it. He had a lot of money invested in that house in terms of, of uh, a loan, which, uh, which had an interest rate lock and everything else. He probably lost quite a bit of money on that deal when they forced him to sell the house back. So it's, uh, you know, he didn't read the contract. This is such good information. Can you remind our viewers once again the name of the publication and where they can get it? It's uh, 16 Ways to Avoid Problems, or Avoid Remodeling, Repair, and Construction Problems. We just call it the 16 Ways book. You can get it by calling the CCB at 503-378-4621 or at the website, which will be at the bottom of the uh, screen. Okay, and for our viewers, if you um, miss these numbers or the websites, you will have an opportunity to look at those again if you look at the Oregon State Bar's website, and I'll give you that information at the end of the program. Where does someone go for help when they're having issues with a contractor? Well, once, once, you're, once you're already going. If, if, you've, if you've got a problem, uh, one of the places, and you're not sure where to go, one of the places is to call up the Attorney General's office or go to their website. Uh, they have a, a consumer hotline, and, uh, and I think that uh, their numbers will be dis either displayed or we can give those. Um, I think they're going to be displayed on your screen. The, the other place is to go to the CCB, and I've already given you that the, the phone number for that, or you can go and check out our website. Uh, we have a lot more information besides the 16 Ways book, and there's a whole description of how you can file a claim, and I will be talking a little bit more about the claims process in a few minutes. Uh, what other places? A couple other places. Uh, the Federal Trade Commission, interestingly enough, is not, is not going to be able to provide you assistance, but they have a wealth of information on their website uh, because Federal Trade Commission is primarily charged with protecting consumers. And if you simply type in Federal Trade Commission and Google it, it'll take you right to the website, which is pretty interactive. Then certainly talking to a lawyer, getting some advice. And as Bill said, a lot of people don't want to do that because they think it's too expensive, even though what's at issue is thousands and thousands of dollars. Uh, certainly contacting the Oregon State Bar and going to the lawyer referral service uh, department will will connect you up with a lawyer who uh, is familiar with this area of the law and for um, an hour or two hours worth of time is uh, money well spent. Is there an opportunity for an individual to handle these things themselves? Can they go to small claims court or are there other alternatives? Yeah, there's amounts of money that are low enough that it's you probably won't spend money on an attorney, and, and the small claims cutoff is $5,000, and that's one place you can go. If you can't file a CCB claim because it's too late to do that, or, uh, or you're not dealing with a licensed contractor, that might be a choice. Unfortunately, litigation is always problematical because you file it, and then the process takes over, and you never know what the end result is is going to be. But sometimes people are forced to uh, get involved in litigation simply out of uh, lack of other alternatives. Anybody can file a lawsuit on them by themselves. They don't need to have a lawyer, although the rules and the procedures are set up so that other and small claims court, it's oftentimes advisable, but uh, an individual can represent themselves in a lawsuit involving any amount of money. How, what does the the CCB do with a complaint? What's the mm. process if you if if it is a licensed uh, mm -hmm. contractor and you go there? Well, if it's a licensed contractor and if you're filing your claim uh, within uh, 
one year of occupancy of a new home or one year of substantial completion of an ex work on an existing home, uh, you can file a claim. But the first thing you have to do is you need to go ahead and um, send a notice to the contractor. It can just be a simple letter. It has to be sent by certified mail, and there's instructions for this on our website. Uh, and you just need to say, I intend to file a claim with the CCB. Uh, 30 days later, then you would uh, fill out our claim form and submit it with a copy of your contract and the other things that we instruct you to do. And then we will evaluate the claim, determine whether it looks like we have jurisdiction. If we do, then we will ask for you to pay us $50. That's a processing fee. The, uh, and then we have one of our field investigators go out, meet with the contractor and the homeowner on the, at the home site. Uh, first, that field investigator tries to see if there's a way that these people can come to a settlement agreement, a mediated settlement agreement. And if uh, that doesn't happen, then the investigator observes the work and makes a report back to our office. And then from there on, uh, we, we may give the, op the contractor an opportunity to, uh, to try to repair the, the problem. Uh, if the contractor doesn't do that or the contractor isn't licensed anymore, then we will ask the homeowner to get bids to get uh, so we can establish damages and then we issue an order which may either be to dismiss the claim or it may be to, um, uh, to have the contractor pay money. If the contractor doesn't comply with the order, uh, well actually there's, I want to step back, if, if either side at that point can request a hearing if they aren't satisfied with what we've ordered. And if they do that, then it goes through a process that's very much like a, a court trial in front of a judge. Uh, you can do it w by yourself without an attorney, although if the issues are complicated and the money is great, you probably do want to get an attorney. Uh, but at any rate, at the end of this process, there's an order. If the contractor doesn't pay that order, then, uh, then we will send it to the contractor's bonding company, and the bonding company will pay up to the amount of the bond. Now, the bond is $15,000. We uh, often, our orders don't exceed that, but I will say that they often do. You know, we've, I've signed orders for $200,000, so. Okay, are there any things that um, a, someone who's ready for one of these projects should know about construction law? Um, one of the things is, uh, I guess there's a question about whether you can rescind the contract, Dick. Yeah. Um, a lot of people think that whenever you enter into any contract, you always have the right to change your mind within a short period of time. And the, the short period of time that people often think about is three days. And actually, there's a very limited number of circumstances where uh, you have the right to change your mind. One of them is not buying a used car, which a lot of people happen to think you have the right to change your mind for three days, even though some of the car dealers advertise that. That's just part of the contract, but there's no law that says that. But when you are uh, having remodeling done or alterations done to your house as compared to an initial construction, remodeling, whatever, and as a result of that, the builder is taking a security interest in the house, which they almost certainly will, you have three business days, three business days to change your mind. So they'll get all the contracts signed and whatever, but they can't start work until uh, that three business days happens. And they'll give you a form that you can use, but you also have the right to notify them in any, any manner that you are changing, changing your mind. And you need to be careful about the builder trying to talk you out of that. Sometimes they'll they will don't want you to change mind because they've already invested some money in buying stuff even though they haven't delivered it yet. So uh, generally the, the biggest one is a three business day uh, right to change your mind. Then do these rules apply to all contractors? Um, yes, they would apply. I mean this is all contract law and it's to a certain extent consumer based law which is built into our federal and state statutes. Uh, so, but, but the, the whole business about being hiring a licensed contractor just applies to construction contractors. Yeah. Are there other um, organizations for different types of contractors? There, there are. The landscapers have a landscape contractor board. They have very similar, matter of fact, we try to make our, 
our rules somewhat parallel so that it's easier for people to deal with. But if you're dealing with a landscaper, uh, then you're, uh, you're dealing with the Landscape Contractors Board, and it would be a similar process for filing a claim with them. What about other service providers? A lot of us don't do a big remodeling project, but we have to call the plumber or we have to call the electrician. What about Well, now a, a plumber or an electrician, the, the company that provides you that service still has to be a licensed construction contractor. You still have the same, everything that applies there. But in addition, that plumber or that electrician has to be a licensed or certified uh, plumber or electrician. And that gives you a little bit, if, if they don't, comply with the code and the work they do, you can then also make a complaint to the building codes division. Um, they have some leverage that they can exert on that plumber or that electrician. And I think that the same considerations go into hiring an electrician or a plumber, although on a much smaller scale. Certainly while the plumber's there fooling around with your toilet, they probably don't want you snapping pictures of them. But you need to make sure that you understand what they're going to do and what the the rate is, which may change depending on the time frame and how, whether it's an emergency or the time of day that it, that it goes on, and what the expected results are. Okay. And I think when you're uh, when you've run out of when you're not sure about you know when you're not dealing with a landscaper or construction contractors, you may want to call the attorney general's office because they do have a consumer group that, that deals with some of these. They can at least point you in the right direction. Okay, and, and now the Attorney General, what else can they, uh, will they be able to do? Well, the Attorney General, and the, probably their ultimate authority is if you have a contractor or a, a builder or some other service provider who, who is violating the law in regard to a large enough segment of the population or preying on a particular segment of the population, be it the elderly, be it low income, whatever, the Attorney General um, has the right to take legal action. And whether they take legal action depends <coughs> on, unfortunately, available resources and priorities, which there's a whole, I imagine they have a whole list of what priorities are, uh, would not be taking it on behalf of the individual. They're not representing a particular individual, they're representing the public. So other than maybe sending a, a letter to the uh, offender and uh, giving advice to the consumer, uh, the Attorney General is going to be somewhat limited in what they can actually do for individual problems. Okay, we've been talking about construction and those types of projects, but what about a car mechanic? Because all of us eventually will take our car to the car mechanic. Do the same rules apply to them? Well, kind of the same concepts do, I and mean, I think you got two different issues depending on who the mechanic is. So the first kind of place we'll take our cars is kind of the drive-through 20, 30 minute place. You know what you're getting, there's a menu up on the board and they do it and you pay and you drive out and then you don't discover the problem uh, until later on. Uh, they forgot to tighten a bolt and all your, your uh, cooling fluid leaked out or uh, something along those lines. It's usually not uh, a matter of them doing something that you didn't authorize. So in that case, you would, you would progress just like you would in any dispute. Call them up and politely try to relate the problem and, and try and uh, see if you can resolve it. And if that doesn't work, you send a letter politely but firmly outlining the problem and explaining what it is and what you want and when you want it done, keeping a copy for yourself. Taking your car into a dealership is a different problem because if they do something that you don't, didn't authorize, you refuse to pay for it, they've got the car, you don't. And they're not going to give you back the car until you pay for it. And the longer you delay paying for it, they're going to start charging you a fee for storing the car. So you're kind of in a, between a rock and a hard place. And oftentimes your best um, bet then is to just swallow your pride, pay the money, and then take the action you need to recover it. There are some pretty strict consumer protection laws about car mechanics doing anything more than is expressly authorized by the consumer. And again, as, as Bill would point out, and we've mentioned, when you go in to take your car, 
and they fill out that work order, read the work order so you know exactly what it is they're going to do and not going to do. Biggest problem is, of course, they say, well, we'll look at it. And they call you up on the phone and they say, this is what we found and this is what it's going to cost to fix it. You don't have a work order, but writing down who, who called, the time of day, what was said, that's, that's, uh, that would be definitely things you should do. Okay. We're just about out of time. Um, what would you, if you have just one thing to say is the most important message to give to our viewers about hiring a contractor or another service provider, what is that? I think I would say use a written contract and understand it. Every word. Okay. I would say the same thing. It sounds cynical, but if it's not in writing, don't believe them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And the one other thing you said was communication, and that's mm -hmm. an important piece. Right. Okay. And don't skimp. If it's a big project, get some, get some legal advice so you really do understand everything about it. All right. Thank you both very much. We've run out of time. That's all we have time for, and I appreciate both of you taking time to, to come and talk to us about this uh, very important topic. More information about this subject and others is available to you online. Just visit the Oregon State Bar's website at www.oregonstatebar.org. Our website contains a wide array of information on legal topics, and while you're there, you can comment on this program and to give suggestions for future programs. And don't forget, that's where you can get the websites and phone numbers for all the information we've given you today. I hope you found this program helpful and informative. On behalf of the Oregon State Bar, I thank you for joining us. I hope to see you next time on Legal Links.